Thanks Great. everyone for joining us for today's webinar. We're going to be looking at JobKeeper, JobSeeker, Disability Support Pension, a whole lot of complicated questions John Verrill's online to answer for you. So I'm Andrea Salmon, I'm facilitating today's webinar. We start all our programs by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional custodians, past, present and emerging, on whose lands we meet today, no matter where we're dialing in from. And we, <coughs> we acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of Aboriginal people to country and we respect the cultural authority of the elders in each community. It is my pleasure to have John Beryl online and you can see him <laughs> as well as see his picture on the slide. John is an insurance and superannuation lawyer with Beryl and Watson, a company who specialises in superannuation and insurance law. And John's actually been part of our education program for over 20 years. He's been providing advice to people living with chronic illness and with disability in regard to work entitlements, superannuation, DSP, all sorts of legal issues. And he also does our talks on uh, travel and car insurance and even answers questions around um, road traffic authority kind of questions. So it's wonderful to have you with us today, John. No worries. I'm, I'm actually gonna turn off my camera because I think that's mucking up my internet a little bit and I'll mute myself and we'll look forward to you. You just let me know when you want me to change slides. Okay, will do. Hi everybody. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's get into it. We've got an hour. Um, if you've got any questions, as Andrea says, just fire them away and we'll deal with them as we go. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about is Centrelink entitlements uh, with a focus on the disability support pension. Um, so we've had a few questions in advance. Andrea's got a few questions in advance from folk about the sort of issues they're interested in. And for some of you, you are already off work and on Centrelink payments, or you are considering stopping work, or you've reached a point of stopping work, or you just want to look about, look at, look, see what the future might hold for you. So this is a session where we're going to talk about what the Centrelink benefits are, and in particular what how the COVID-19 or the government's coronavirus response has affected those benefits. All right, so slide two, Andrea. Next one, beauty. So uh, there are a number of benefits. We'll, I'll talk briefly about Job Seeker and Job Keeper, right? They're, they're the two, the Job Seeker used to be called New Start, right? So sort of the unemployment benefit. I'll talk about that, I'll talk about Job Keeper, which is the government initiative that was introduced in March this year. And there, but then we'll talk about the DSP and have a focus on that. And I'll tell you why in a minute. So <clears throat> if you stop work, if you are out of work, then um, you may be eligible for Centrelink benefits, the sort of base benefit, if you like, used to be called New Start, it's now called Job Seeker. It had a brand change. Um, and for years, there's been clamor, particularly amongst those of us in the consumer movement to say that, uh, new start or now job seeker rate <coughs> is hopeless and people can't possibly live on it. The base rate for it is $280 a week or 560 bucks a fortnight or $70 a day, right? Um, so the question is, can people live on that? <coughs> Not $70 a day, $40 a day. Um, so the, the new start base rate was 280 bucks a week for a single person and for a couple it's less, you know, it's $510 a week. Uh, for the couple. Um, but from March this year, um, the job seeker was effectively doubled as part of the government's coronavirus response because they introduced a thing called the um, coronavirus supplement or the job seeker supplement, which was $550 a fortnight. Next page, Andrea. So with the job, with the coronavirus supplement, the rate went from a base rate of $560 a fortnight to $1,100 a fortnight. And for a couple, it's <coughs> $1,100. Oh, so that's actually, there's too many ones in that. It's $1,060 a fortnight for each person. Um, so that's been <coughs> in place from March until now. And I'll talk about JobKeeper a bit later on. But the government announced a little while ago a raft of changes to uh, wind back the coronavirus um, package that they put in place. And the key change to the job seeker is that the they're taking away $300 a fortnight out of the $550 a fortnight supplement. So the, in other words, the job seeker base rate will fall for a single from $1,100 a fortnight to $815 a fortnight, as in 300 bucks a fortnight comes off it. So you'll be on then 
bit over 400 bucks a week. All right, and so that's due to start from next week. So this is very topical. Um, and then that continues until the end of the year. Uh, now the government has made no announcement as to what they're gonna do after the end of the year, but there have been noises that they're not that there's gonna be a bit of a soft landing and they may put in, some, in place something else. Um, as we'll see when we talk about job seek, uh, job keeper in a minute, the, the arrangements for that are continuing on until the end of March next year. So maybe what they'll do with the job seeker rate is flatten it a little bit more, <clears throat> at least for another three months or so. We'll see. We've got to wait and see. But the key thing is the job seeker rate, which um, traditionally was very poor of 560 bucks a fortnight, suddenly people got a doubling of that effectively, but now it's winding back to something like what it was before. And as I'll talk about in a bit, the key thing about that is, is now that for this period of six months, the job seeker rate was in fact more than the disability support pension. I'll talk about the DSP in a minute. Um, but come 25th of September, the job seeker rate falls back below the DSP rate. And that's a significance for people who are chronic, who are long-term uh, out of the workforce. Next slide assistant. All right, so there, there is an income and assets test that's applicable to job seeker, uh, job seeker payments. The normal, the current income and assets test is you get the first 106 bucks a fortnight you earn from income for, uh, without any effect on your job seeker payments and thereafter it, it does affect it at 60 cent, 50 cents in the dollar and then 60 cents in the dollar and then from September they're, they're making changes to that so the income free threshold is designed to encourage people to who are potentially able to do some work. So there's the income free threshold is raised to 300 bucks a fortnight. So you can earn 150 bucks a week before that will impact on, before the income will impact on your job seeker payment, this reduced job seeker payment. Um, uh, so, uh, and that's from 25th of September, but the reduction for every dollar you earn after that is 60 cents in the dollar. So if you earn 400 bucks a fortnight, then, uh, uh, 40, uh, 60 cent, sixty dollars of that will come off your um, uh, job seeker payment because that's you know sixty dollars out of the hundred over and over and above the three hundred bucks a fortnight. Next slide, please. There's also an assets test <coughs> in relation to job seeker, but uh, because of the coronavirus package, the job seeker assets test was suspended. But from 25th of September, it comes back in, all right? And what that means is that eligibility for job seeker payments is subject to uh, looking at what, what assets you've got, taking into account any home you own, or uh, if you don't own a home, uh, a higher level of assets. So what it, what it means is that <clears throat> um, if you own a home, um, then you, there is a, a, an assets test threshold of, if you're a single, of $268,000 where it doesn't affect your Centrelink payments, um, your job seeker payments. But anything, every thousand dollars of assets you've got over that, if you look at the third dot point there, reduces the job seeker payments by three bucks. So if you've got a lot of money uh, squirreled away in, the, in a bank account or in shares or whatever, then uh, not superannuation, mind you, but in those things, then it will affect your uh, job seeker payments. And depending on if you've got a lot, well, then it can effectively, you can reduce it to nil, right? But for this period of time we've had with a coronavirus supplement, the whole assets test look see and reduction has been suspended, right? But that's coming off come 25th of September. So the government is winding back. They've had this, the coronavirus package has been in place for six months now but these changes are going to affect folk. Um, and I'll talk about the comparison between the income test and the assets test in relation to DSP in a sec. All right, job seeker payments are indexed, but they're only indexed in accordance with the CPI, which as we all know is bugger all at the moment. So it, uh, the, the payments aren't going up by much. And that contrasts with pension payments such as the DSP, where the uh, indexation rate is a lot higher. It's the average my weekly earnings, all right? Um, there are a couple of other matters that are relevant to the job seeker that are rising out of this coronavirus world we've lived in. And that is that the mutual obligations, if you're, if you're on job seeker payments, you've got to look for work, right? You've got to have come up with, you've got to look for, you've got to prove that you apply for 20 jobs every month, 
that's just sort of a standard, a baseline. Uh, and those mutual obligations with uh, job search requirements were suspended as part of the coronavirus deal on the basis that there weren't jobs out there to go look for, uh, but they've been reintroduced. Um, <coughs> they're not, not necessarily fully introduced, but they have been um, <coughs> reintroduced in some form as of the 4th of August, okay? Um, but not so much in Victoria though. Uh, now, the other thing is that if you apply for Job Seeker, um, then uh, you have you don't get paid for the first week. There's a waiting period on it for the first week, but that's been waived as part of the coronavirus deal. And that waiver has been extended to the end of the year. So if you apply for Job Seeker, you can get it straight away. You don't have, there isn't any waiting period. All right, so that's that's um, job seeker, right? Um, now, the next slide I put up is about the DSP, the eligibility for the rates, et cetera, for DSP. And there and there, and I'm contrasting those with job seeker because um, traditionally, pre-coronavirus, it was always people were always better off if they were eligible for the DSP. Financially, they weren't better off health-wise because to get on the DSP is hard, you've got to be significantly disabled but you are much better off financially to the tune of somewhere between $300 and $400 a fortnight better off, as I'll explain in a sec. But during the coronavirus period, because you had this weird setup where the government gave you this job seeker supplement of 550 bucks a fortnight, you're actually better off being on job seeker, um, which is um, a very anomalous situation. But as the wind back happens come 25th of September, the job seeker rate falls back below the DSP rate and with the other benefits such as, and I'll show them in a sec, such as the income and assets test, et cetera, um, uh, you are better off on the financially on the DSP, okay? So anyway, so but D DSP payments were completely completely unaffected or been unaffected by the coronavirus. So they weren't subject to any, any significant um, government uh, support. The only support they got was there was that $750 payment um, uh, that was lump of money that was paid to people who are on government benefits. Um, there was one paid in March and there was another in payable in July. Um, okie dokie, so DSPs remain the same. So DSP rates, right? So the DSP base rate is 860 bucks a fortnight. And there are a couple of supplements that you can add in. And if you get those supplements, it's 944 a fortnight, i.e. 400, in other words, 470 bucks a week, as opposed to um, under Job Seeker, if you pre-March this year before the coronavirus stuff came in, is 280 bucks a week. So it's something like 350 to 400 bucks a week better off on um, DSP than you were on Job Seeker, right? But with a coronavirus supplement, because that tipped it above to $1,100 a fortnight, you're actually better off on the corona on um, Job Seeker, which is which was anomalous, but come next week with the job seeker supplement coming down, being reduced by 300 bucks a fortnight, it means that the DSP rate goes back above job seeker, if you get what I'm saying. So the DSP rate for a single with these supplements is nine, it's 470 odd bucks a week. Whereas for the coronavirus, sorry, whereas for job seeker, um, it's uh, $400 a week. Uh, and then there's the couple of rates here as well. Next slide, please, assistant. Uh, then you've got the income and assets test, right? So the income and assets test works differently for the DSP, it's more favorable, right? So for the DSP, uh, they've got, <coughs> there's an income free threshold of up to 178 bucks a fortnight. So you, you don't get, there's no reduction uh, if you're earning up to $178 a fortnight. And then after that, it's 50 cents in the dollar. Now that contrasts with the, uh, um, <coughs> job seeker rate, which is 60 cents in the dollar. Although, as you saw, right, that the income three three threshold went from uh, got, went from 106 bucks a fortnight to 300 dollars a fortnight. So, at least for this period from September to December, the income test uh, offsetting um, still works out pretty okay for um, the for um, people on Job Seeker as opposed to DSP, but um, probably it will very soon it will be to your detriment, right? So the DSP offset 50 cents in the dollar will be less than 
is less than that under the uh, under job seek, which is 60 cents in the dollar. They've just got different thresholds, right? Next slide, please. The DSP assets test, it's the same, right? It's the same, essentially the same as um, for uh, the, the uh, for job seeker, okay? Uh, now, here's the other thing is the DSP uh, rates, their pensions, and they get increased not at the CPI rate, but at what's called um, a percentage of the average my average total male average male total average weekly earnings right so it's a higher rate so what that has meant so it used to be that the DSP and a job seeker were or new start as it was then were at the same rate but when they changed the indexation rate for pensions to be this average male weekly earnings rate rather than CPI because CPI has been so flatlined for for so long it meant that the benefit the, the the amount of the benefits split and the DSP rate, along with other pensions, they started going up at a much higher rate than did um, uh, New Start or now Job Seeker. And so that explains why there's such a difference in the two rates of benefit. Okay. All right. Now we get on to Job Keeper. Now Job Keeper is it's not part of Centrelink, but it's it's another one of the coronavirus initiatives the government put in place uh, in March this year. And what they basically do <coughs> is they support businesses to keep employees in work uh, while we ride out this coronavirus thing. Well, it's gone for six months and it's still going. And that's why, as I'll explain in a sec, the government has extended it to March next year. Okay, next slide. So the, the, there's some eligibility requirements here. So um, uh, not all in, not everybody's eligible for the job keeper. Um, the, basically eligibility is, it's designed to, test employers who are struggling in the coronavirus who are suffering loss of uh, a loss of profit or loss of turnover and as a result of that they're either you know they will struggle to keep employees going or they've had to stand them down um, and this is designed to keep to, to sort of buttress that to keep the em employers keep the employees in the employer the employer while we ride out the coronavirus so there are some eligibility tests um, if you work for a company with a turnover of less than a billion dollars um, a year, then it's got a if their <coughs> turnover loss of turnover is a reduction of uh, thirty percent or more, then they can be eligible for JobKeeper. If you work for a charity, um, then it's fifteen percent. If you work for a big corporation that's got a turnover of more than a billion dollars. Um, then the reduction has to be 50%. If it's under those, then you're not eligible. Then the employer is not eligible to sign up to JobKeeper, right? Um, and then the payments that are made, and I'll talk about the payments in a sec, they're made to eligible employees. So it's, it's not every employee. So an, an eligible employee is someone who is, their employer is an eligible employer, right? They've been employed since March 20. Um, they're currently employed or they're stood down or they've been, Terminated and reinstated with the same employer, uh, and they've been and they've been employed on a, they're employed on a full time basis, a part time basis, or long term casual, right? Um, so that's the, the controversy with the job keeper stuff has been ca it, the people you know in the media over the few months has been sort of a, around things like oh we casuals miss out um, and foreign nationals miss out, um, you know foreign students etc miss out. And that's true. So if you, you've got to be a long-term casual, as in you've got to be there more than 12 months, and it only applies to Australian residents. Um, uh, so, you know, kids from overseas, et cetera, students from overseas, nah. Uh, Self-employed people can also be eligible, right? And the, right, the way it works is that um, if you are stood down or if, um, you, if you're employed uh, and you're still working or you're stood down, then the employer and your employer is eligible and applies then you are paid you are paid your wage by the employer um, or if you're not being paid a wage then you get paid fifteen hundred dollars a fortnight and um, uh, so say say if you worked at a place and the, the anomaly is that if you if you're working at a job that you're being paid less than a thousand uh, fifteen hundred bucks a fortnight you get paid fifteen hundred bucks a fortnight so one of the examples given on the ATO website was someone worked two casual jobs. <laughs> you can only pick one 
uh, one of the casual jobs paid a thousand bucks a fortnight, um, and that person got paid under the job keeper rate fifteen hundred dollars, right? So the employer pays fifteen hundred bucks, and then the government reimburses them essentially. Um, all right, or if you are being paid, say you were being earning, I don't know, two thousand bucks a fortnight, um, then the employer, the employer, and the employer still paying you that, then the employer then gets fifteen hundred dollars a fortnight from the government to keep you to keep you employed. It's designed it's designed to keep people in work, and it's been, in my view, and I think in the view of most pundits, extraordinarily effective in keeping the economy or keeping people in work. Um, so that JobKeeper was introduced. Those, the JobKeeper was introduced in March this year, um, but there are changes to it. Um, and from the 28th of September, as in next week, uh, changes and the reduction and and it starts to wind back. So the government's winding back the benefits to JobKeeper. So it reduces. It comes off from 1,500 bucks a fortnight to 1,200 dollars a fortnight. And it's 1,200 dollars a fortnight if you were earning, if you were working more than 80, uh, 20 hours a week. Average out over a four-week period um, at, at set times. <laughs> if you were working less than that, then it's seven hundred and fifty dollars a fortnight. All right, so it, go, it sort of can be cut in half. And then that go, that's from twenty-eighth um, of September until the end of the year. And then from the start of next year, it drops again further to a thousand bucks a fortnight if you're if you're working eighty hours a week, eighty hours a, a so 80 hours of in a four week slot as at July 20. Um, and or and if you're working less than that, then it's 650 bucks a fortnight. So the support to the employer to keep you in em employment, which is 1500 bucks a fortnight now, reduces down to uh, 1200 or 750 or 1650. So it's, it comes off, all right? So that's the job keeper rates. Next. Um, so the JobKeeper payments are not subject to the Centrelink income and assets tests, uh, uh, or not subject to an income and assets tests like Centrelink benefits. Uh, although the Centrelink assets test has been suspended at least until next week. Um, <clears throat> there are, and with the JobKeeper, uh, when the em employers did get on to assess their eligibility back in March, they had to do an assessment in March of their eligibility to get on the JobKeeper program, uh, and they've got to do a reassessment from uh, next week, right? So that reassessment has to be a reassessment about the decline in their turnover, all right? Um, and the relevant employment relationship between the employer and the employee is assessed at July 2020 to see whether the employee is eligible as well. Okay, I think that's the end of that next one. Yeah, all right. So that's a summary of the three basic, the three benefit, the three benefits that are relevant to you guys if you're off work. Um, or if you've been off work and you're on and you're on JobKeeper or new or um, uh, DSP, or if you're in employment and you're under the um, coronavirus program through JobKeeper, uh, so that's been in place now for six months. The government's winding it back. The changes are happening next week, right? So I want to focus now on the DSP. So and the reason is, as I say, but because before March this year. DSP was sort of the um, uh, was the oh, I was going to say pot at the end of the rainbow, but it ain't no pot of gold, that's for sure. But it, it compared to what Job Seeker was, which is you know uh, forty dollars a day, two hundred eighty bucks a week. Um, as I said, DSP rate was that um, somewhere between you know four hundred to four hundred and seventy bucks uh, a week, probably four seventy bucks a week. So it's it's a lot higher. Um, then um, New Start, um, the New Start stroke Job Seeker was, but for that six-month period with the coronavirus supplement, Job Seeker was all was fine. You didn't need to worry about trying to get on the DSP. But now it's back in play. The DSP eligibility and whether you're eligible for it is back in play because now the DS come next week, the DSP is worth more than uh, Job Seeker. Uh, and then who knows what it'll be in January, but it's unlikely to be any more. It's likely to be wound back some more. So it's gonna, it's gonna, it brings back into focus DSP and eligibility for DSP, right? So what I've got here is slides which talk about the DSP eligibility requirements, um, and it's tough, but it's not impossible. It's tough. 
right? Just to give you a little bit of a history, the DSP eligibility <coughs> underwent a big change in 2011. And the big change was until then, if you were unable to work more than 15 hours a week for two years, um, subject to a couple of other things, you were basically eligible for the DSP, right? So if you're a long-term, uh, if you had MS and you'd reached the point of not being able to work or your ability to work was very restricted in the, on a long-term basis, then you, could, then you were eligible for a DSP. The process was relatively simple. There was a form to fill in. It was a duty big long one. Uh, and doctors used to crack it over having to fill in half a dozen pages worth of application form. <clears throat> but it was all doable and a lot of people went on, a lot of people were on the DSP. In fact, as at 2011, something like 850,000 people were on it. And that's, and because the DSP was at a higher rate than New Start as it was then by, you know, by about 350 bucks a week, a fortnight, uh, the bean counters were telling the government, there's too many people on the DSP, you got to get them off. Um, you got to get them back into work or something, but we, this is not sustainable. So it was then the Labor government introduced these changes where they changed the eligibility requirements for the DSP. And when I say changed them, they made them a lot tougher, right? So the old rule, which was un, unfit to work more than 15 hours a week for two years, that was, <clears throat> that was basically the be all end all of the old requirements. But under the new one, under the post 2011 requirements, it's just one of five requirements. So I've got the eligibility requirements listed here. Um, and they are, if you, if you go down the list, you've got to be more than 16, you've got to be an Australian resident, uh, and you've got to have uh, a medical condition that's been diagnosed, right? So you've got to have, so your MS would have to be diagnosed. It's got to be fully treated and stabilised, right? So that can be a problem for MS in that you can be under a uh, fully treated, you can be under a new treatment regime, for example. You could be trying new drug therapies um, or whatever. You could be changing from one doctor to another, uh, with different treatment modalities, okay? So there can be issues about whether your condition has been fully treated, right? But you've got to reach that threshold to be eligible for the DSP and it's got to be stabilised. Now, uh, again, that can be problematic with chronic illnesses and MS is one where the symptoms are like a roller coaster for a lot, a lot of folk. Not everybody, but for a lot of folk, it can be like that. So is the condition stabilised? Well, MS, that can be a question mark. But here's the big kahuna. This is the one that gets people every time. It's the 20 points on the impairment tables, right? I don't know if any of you guys have uh, dealt with this before, but this is the thing that nobody under, or very few people understand, and it gets people every time. Um, uh, so what happens, we see, I'm a volunteer at, one of my hats I wear is I'm a volunteer at the, um, the Centrelink Legal Services called the Social Security Rights Victoria, SSRV. And we saw for a long time, um, people would apply for DSPs and they would get a report or a certificate from their doctor saying, this person can't work, right? They're, 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 they've, got a, well, they've got a health problem, they're too sick, they can't work and they won't be able to work long term. So paying the DSP. Well, that don't get you, that gets you through, that might get you through, um, uh, one one of the hurdles, but it doesn't get you through all the hurdles. And and what we would find is that none of the doctors would address these point system. I'll talk about that what they are in a sec. But you what you've got to get is this, there's these impairment tables, and you've got to get 20 points on the impairment table in order to be to get through the gateway to be eligible for the DSP. Okay, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a sec. You've also got a completed a thing called a program of support which is basically uh, through a rehab provider or a disability provider to um, assess you and try and assist you to get back into the workforce. This was introduced by the Labor government under Jenny Macklin was the minister at the time. In 2011, the idea with a laudable notion of there were a lot of people with disabilities who were sitting on Centrelink, sitting on the DSP, who could have been eligible for work. And what we need to do is to try and encourage them and encourage employers to take them to get them back into the workforce because that's best, you know, it's sort of a win-win for everybody. But what they did was they introduced this thing called a program of support as part of the requirements, which means you've got to go through this provider to try and help you. And that's that's all laudable in theory, but in practice, it's been a blunt instrument. Most of us think 
it's been those of us in the committee sector think it's been used as a blunt instrument to keep people off the DSP because a program support normally goes for 18 months and in that 18 month period you are not on the DSP you're on a job seeker so you're at the much lesser rate coronavirus supplement aside um, and you've got to and you've got to complete it um, and at the end of that then if you haven't got a job or whatever and if you haven't been breached because of you know the providers unreasonable requirements etc then then you can potentially get through it get through that gateway but it's been as i say it's been used as a blunt instrument effectively to keep people out at least for an 18 month period from the dsp now um and then you've also got to work and that and then the last dot point is the 15 hours a week for the next two years requirement so that's the only that's the only one of the original obligations that's carried over the, the rest the rest of these obligations are all new since 2011, right? Now, there are a couple of exceptions to some of the requirements. And the main one is uh, this point system, right? If you get, there are 15 impairment tables and I'll spell them out in a sec. Um, if you qualify, if you get 20 points on one of the tables, then you don't, then you go through that gateway and you don't have to go through that program of support I just talked about. So you're not locked out of the DSP for 18 months, right? If you get 20 points on one table and 20 points is, as I'll talk about in a sec, means you've got to have a um, severe impairment. That's, you've got to be classified as having a severe impairment under one of the tables. And one of the tables, and I'll talk about it, and we'll go through a, an example of it, is fatigue for fatigue, which is probably the most common feature for MS. So uh, there are also other there's also other ones um, other exceptions where you don't have to go through all the requirements and the one that's probably potentially relevant to um, uh, people with MS is if you need nursing home level care um, there will be there are some people who need nursing home level care and if you do then you you can get what's called a manifest grant which means it's a lot quicker pathway to the dsp you don't have to go through the 20 point system all that stuff right uh right well these are the tables right That's, this is the thing i was talking about the 20 points right so what it is is there are 15 tables that measure your functional impairment your ability to do day-to-day -day stuff right and uh, it covers things like, as you see there, first one is exertion and physical exertion, stamina, as in fatigue, upper limb, lower limb, relevant to MS potentially, spinal function, potentially, mental health function. So, you know, quite a lot of people with chronic illnesses develop mental health issues around their circumstances, etc. cetera. Um, if you've got <coughs> substance abuse issues, and some people do, then that's table six, brain function. So cognitive function problems are often a feature of um, a symptom of people with MS. So the, the, <coughs> most of these, the first part, these tables are rele potentially relevant to someone with MS. Communication, intellectual function. So if you, as you go down the list, the less are probably less relevant. Visual function, if you've got optic neuritis, that could be relevant, table 12. Um, so the, there are these, so what you've got is these tables that measure people's um, functional inability to do day-to-day -day activities. So it's day-to-day -day activities, a thing like cleaning, um, cooking, catching public transport, shopping, working in a workplace, communicating with people, that sort of stuff. Um, it, it measures not so much your ability to work, but it's more aimed at measuring how your condition affects your ability to do day-to-day -day activities, right? And it's under one of these 15 tables. You can use more than one for your health problems. So if you've got MS, you might, if you've got MS that's, that where your symptoms are fatigue, uh, cognitive issues, uh, say so it's fatigue and cognitive issues, right? So that would be table one is fatigue, covers fatigue and table seven covers brain function, okay? If you've got mental health problems into it, in the mix as well, well, then it can be table five, right? So you get measured under these tables for the level of your functional impairment, right? And the relevant ones are, you get five points on the table if you've got a mild impairment, you get 10 points if you've got a moderate impairment, you get 20 points if you've got a severe impairment, right? Now, as I said before, if you get 20 points on the one table, so if you've got a severe 
fatigue under table one, then you go through the gateway and you don't need to do the program support, which is important because that locks you out of the um, DSP for 18 months, right? Um, there are some exceptions to that, but that's the general rule. Okay, so, and what I'll do is, but it's tough to, to be, to, to me, it, it, the tables are quite prescriptive. It's got quite high level prescription about what you can and can't do in, in measuring whether you have a mild, moderate or severe impairment, right? Um, and it's not easy to qualify for these things, but measure it, it does. And if you don't, and, and if you get 20 points on the one, severe impairment on the one, bang, you're through the gateway. But if you've got, if you get 20 points on a combination of tables, then you're still in the game, but you've got to go through the program of support. That's the difference, right? So if you've got MS, as I said, with if you've got fatigue issues, if you've got uh, cognitive issues, and if you've got, um, uh, so you've got visual problems from optic neuritis. Well, then you can be under tables one, uh, seven, and twelve, right? So you get ten points on for your fatigue, and you get five points each for your um, cognitive issues and your visual function problems. You, that you combine them together, that gets you twenty points. But because you didn't get twenty points on the one table, you're going through a program of support, which means you go through this job service. Uh, disability service provider to try and help you get back to work. Now, look, a lot of them are some of the, a lot of them are really good. They're, they're terrific. Some of them in, at trying to help people get back into the workforce, which is you know a laudable um, process, um, a laudable aim. But there are some people. The experience of some people with some providers is that um, it can be problematic, uh, and they and some of them can be heavy handed. So you got to pick you got to pick the right ones. Um, and as I say, if you go through the whole thing, it's 18 months. And for 18 months, you're on 280 bucks a week if you're on Job Seeker minus coronavirus supplement, right? Um, so, um, what? So, because I'm a volunteer at the SSRB, what we did was um, we developed a um, a toolkit, a thing called the DSP toolkit, to try and help people with applications for the DSP. Um, because to try and fill in this gap where people would put in an application for DSP and just get a certificate from a doctor saying they can't work, right? And every time they're getting knocked off because they weren't satisfying these requirements, particularly this point system thing, right? So what we did was I wrote this thing over Christmas one time, um, uh, which was, it's, it's letters to a client, letters to the doctor and letters to a caseworker who's assisting a client explaining what the requirements are for the DSP. There's also a letter to, uh, and, and in particular is the letter to the doctor, which explains what the doctor has to do. And also pro formas, which are two page pro formas to go to the doctor to for them to fill in, to satisfy the requirements for the DSP, and in particular to address this point system thing, right? So we've developed this toolkit to assist people with that. <clears throat> um, and, uh, this is a summary of that, right? Um, which is so prepare the pro formas for all the 15 impairment tables. So the first thing you've got to do is identify which of the pro formas are for you, because and that depends on how the health problems are affecting your cognitive, your ability to do day to day stuff. Then you get the right, then you get the you get the, the the one page letter to the doctor which explains what they've got to do. You give that to the doctor. You start off with severe to try and get the 20 points. Because uh, if you get that and Centrelink accept it, then you don't have to do the program support, or you get you wind your way back and get moderate and um, moderate and mild if um, uh, if it looks like you're not going to get the hit the severe measure. Okay, so this this sets out the process to help people. So this is toolkit. You you get it. Um, you get the right. You get the the one page to to you that explains what to do. You get the one page to the doctor and you then take that with with the one page of the doctor, you take that to the doctor with the pro forma and the doctor fills it in if they'll do it. Okay. Um, then this talks also about the process, you know, you lodge an application. The DSP application takes on average four to six months. They ain't quick. Um, if they are accepted, <coughs> then great, you get paid the DSP and it's backdated to when you applied. If it's rejected, you've got rights of appeal. There's an internal right of appeal called an ARO, an A-R-O. Um, 
which is the authorised review officer who decides on the, appeal, the internal appeal. That process takes another four to six months, right? If that's rejected, then you've got a right to appeal to the AAT, it's the Commonwealth AAT, and there are two tiers at the Commonwealth AAT you can appeal to. There's tier one, which is um, an external review, but it's not, it's sort of a round table-y type tribunal hearing. And, and then there's a second appeal to the general division of the AAT, which is more of a court, right? It's not like a court, there's nobody dressed up in bad outfits, but, uh, well, they probably are actually, um, uh, but it's more of a court type setting, but you can, you've got rights of appeal, in other words, but there are time limits applicable to these things. The time limits, the way they play out is you can appeal outside the time, but if you don't, if you appeal outside the time limit, then you don't get back paid the pension. So say I've had cases with, with people who they lodged a DSP application and they win at the AAT, but by the time they won at the AAT, it's been like 12 or 18 months since they applied for the DSP. Uh, and if they win the AAT appeal, you then get back paid the difference between job seeker and DSP all the way to the start. So long as you lodge these appeals within these narrow timelines, all right? So anyway, the toolkit's there to help assist you with that, but it's really important to get help with that and get advice on all that stuff. Now, there is also through SSRV, SSRV has got some funding to prepare sort of an, an online um, toolkit, uh, an online um, thing, which also helps people with DSP applications. It's sort of interactive, helps you, you can fill it in. And it also is interactive for your doctors to fill in, to, to fill it, to provide, to produce a report. Um, in my view, uh, <clears throat> that's more for people who are getting full reports from doctors. If you are, if you are getting, if you've got a doctor, as most of them are very time poor, and you know, uh, and if they're not, if they're going to be filling in a dirty big long application form or whatever, or spending a lot of time, or they don't have time to do it, and they want to charge you. So best, so these the toolkit things, the two page toolkit sheets where they just fill in some bits and tick boxes, then that can help. All right. Um, so <coughs> that's the toolkit, that's the pro forma. So next slide. All right, so this is, as I said, the, with the toolkit, there's a letter to the doctor that explains what the DSP application is about and what and how it works, right? And it also says we've prepared a pro forma report for your consideration. Uh, and if appropriate, can fill in the form. And if you've got any questions, let us know, all right? So that's that one to the doctor. And then the next slide. Right, well, this is an example, right? So th this is an example of the pro forma. And I've done the, printed off the ones for the mild, moderate and severe for um, fatigue, which is the most common symptom of MS. Um, and it covers off uh, the mild, moderate and severe of it. So it's got, it's a two pager. They're all no more than two pages long for the, because, you know, doctors are time poor. And if it's a long thing, they'll want to charge a lot of dough to get to complete it. So it, this covers, this covers off the relevant bits the requirements for the DSP. The big important one is question seven. And question seven deals with the requirements for the um, point system. And it says, if you look at it there, if you have a quick look at it, it says, this is for the mild. This is for a mild one. It says, do you believe the client has a mild impairment of functions requiring physical exertion and stamina? stamina? Does the client experience occasional symptoms, shortness of breath, fatigue? When performing physically demanding activities and due to these symptoms, the client has occasional difficulty walking to local facilities or around shopping centers without stopping to rest or performing physical activities, et cetera, right? And he's able to perform most work-related tasks, right? So that's, that's the requirement for mild, uh, mild fatigue or fun, uh, in functional impairment for fatigue. So the bar set's still pretty low there, but it sort of gives a bit of prescription about what how, how significant the fatigue has to be. But the, the level of significance is mild there. If we go to the next slide, which covers off moderate, it's ramped up a bit. You go to item number seven, it's ramped up a bit. It says um, the client experienced frequent symptoms in performing day-to-day -day activities around the home and community. And due to these symptoms, he's unable to walk far outside the home and needs to drive or get or get other transport to local shops or community facilities or has difficulty performing 
day-to-day -day household activities and is unable to use public transport and walk to the supermarket uh, and perform work-related tasks. So it's ramped up quite significantly there, right? So the level of impairment is, is significantly higher, right? Um, if you've got bad fatigue, you can still be in the game on the 10 points. So if we go to the next slide, which is the which is the, the big kahuna, which is the 20 points, this is the severe impairment one. This is the requirement set out in the social security guide as to what you've got to have to have a severe um, impairment for fatigue. Go to item seven again, it says, usually experiences symptoms when performing light physical activities and due to these symptoms is unable to walk um, around a shopping centre or supermarket without assistance, walk from car park into a shopping centre without assistance or use public transport without assistance, perform light day-to-day day, day -day household activities and difficulty sustaining work-related tasks, right? So again, it's ramped up some more, right? And that's why I said, these are the changes that were introduced in 2011. They're tough, right? They're hard. It's hard to qualify for the DSP, um, but it's not impossible right um, it, and because the difference in job seeker and dsp normally absent coronavirus is around about 350 to 400 bucks or you know 300 to 400 dollars then a fortnight then you know if you're in the ball game for this then it's something you've got to look at okay so this is designed to help you with that um, but there'll be lots of questions and whatever about it but so you let me know okay so what we've talked about so far is what Centrelink benefits people can be eligible for, um, and <clears throat> the, uh, as well as the JobKeeper. Um, and as I said in one in the slides, there's issues around what the income and assets test is and how that applies, right? So depending on what assets you've got, it can affect your Centrelink benefits, and also what income you get from other sources can affect your Centrelink benefits. Now, one of the most common areas, because I'm a superannuation insurance lawyer, I see is um, the effect of Centrelink benefits, on Centrelink benefits of people who are paid out money from a superannuation fund or get insurance payouts for disability or whatever. Um, so, and, uh, and there are things you need to know. And, and it's also topical with the COVID-19 response because as you're probably aware the government has allowed people to get access to up to 10 grand from their super um, in two lots one was before July and one is after July so the the second tranche of that early access to super of 10 grand is still in play now and it's available until the end of the year it's here we'll talk about a sec so so as a, that's why I say it's important to understand how payments for super or insurance can affect your Centrelink benefits for job seeker or the DSP and I say that for the DSP in particular, because if you, and this is one thing I didn't say before, but probably should have said, but I'll tell you now, and that is that if you are on the DSP before the change to the law was made in 2011, you are, you are, you are quarantined from the changes to the law, right? So if you went on the DSP in 2010, uh, because you couldn't work more than 15 hours a week for two years, you stay on that now. You're not subject to this 20 point system, et cetera. You're only subject to it if your Centrelink stops because for example, you go back to work or you get a uh, superannuation payout or an insurance payout or you're on income protection or something like that and it stops your Centrelink benefit and then you reapply, then you reapply for it later. So if you reapply for it, you'll be subject to the new harder, much harder rules, right? Um, so it's really, this stuff is really important to know about how these sort of payments can affect your Centrelink, all right? Um, right, so this is just a little summary of what superannuation benefits are. So super has been compulsory since 92. You can have different types of benefits. You can have money in your super, which is called your account balance. You might have insurance benefits for what's called TPD, which is a lump sum. You might be eligible for income protection payments, maybe for two years, maybe for longer. And there are other insurance benefits there as well. Um, so the super benefits are paid when you, the question is when can you access it? Because it's the access that can affect Centrelink. So super benefits usually are locked up until you get to, you retire from the workforce after the minimum retirement age. 
but you can get early release for permanent incapacity or temporary incapacity for these insurance benefits that we'll talk about in a sec, right? But here's the, here's the thing, with the COVID-19 changes, as I say, people have been eligible to get up to 10 grand out of their super in two lots, right? The first lot was between March and June, you could get, you could apply to get up to 10 grand out of your super and then between July and now it's been extended to the end of the year. It was only it was to be cut off on the 24th of September, like next week, but the government extended it out until the end of the year. So you can get this second tranche of 10 grand out of your super um, uh, by applying for it. It's a really seamless process. I don't know if anybody's done it, but it's really easy to do. You just log on to your MyGov account, you click on to the site that says, I want my super, early access to super, that clicks it through to the ATO. The ATO then does the checks um, as to whether you're eligible. Um, and there's a few eligibility hurdles, but not many. Um, and, then, and then if they approve it, they let you know, and they also let know the nominated super fund, and that super fund then has to pay the money to you. They're not, the super fund doesn't go through its own checks. They basically have to pay the money to you. It's a very seamless process. It takes usually only about a week. To get the dough. Um, <clears throat> there are some eligibility requirements which is set it in that slide. Next slide. Right, so <clears throat> that's, <coughs> pardon me, so that's the account, that's in relation to your account balance, the money that you or your employers paid into your super which is locked up. But people also have through their employment, through superannuation, usually employment super but sometimes outside of that, insurance benefits for disability which are relevant to people whose working lives can be cut short, either temporarily or long-term. And people with chronic illnesses and MS is certainly one of them. It's a condition that afflicts people during their working lives, so it can affect your ability to work. And if it does, these sorts of benefits come into play for you. So if you are stopping or considering stopping work, if you have stopped work, or if you even if you stopped work years ago, you may have these benefits that could potentially be claimed which can, this is a thing called a TPD, Total and Permanent Disability Lump Sum, which is if you can't go back to your normal job or any other suitable work on a long-term basis because of your MS, you can be eligible for a lump of money, which can be 20 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand, or it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars or potentially a seven-figure sum. They can be huge and life-changing. So anyway, these are benefits. And if you, if you claim them and you are paid them, and that's what I do, that's my day job, um, helping people with that. If you claim them and you are paid them, then you've got the option of taking the money out of super or leaving it in a, the superannuation system and rolling it over, etc. And the reason you might want to do that is because of the implications it can have for your Centrelink. Uh, there's also these monthly payments we talked about. So as well as the TPD lump sums, you can have income protection payments, which is that you get a monthly payment if you can't do your normal job for more than the waiting period under the fund, which is usually 90 days, but sometimes a bit less, then you can get paid up to a percentage of your salary, usually capped out at where, you know, if it's rest, it's two and a half grand. If it's Australian super, it's three grand. It, it varies from fund to fund. And you get paid this monthly benefit potentially for two years, maybe even for longer. <clears throat> and you get paid that money. So it operates as effectively as an early release from your superannuation because it's part of your super. Um, so you, you might also have other, if you've got more than one super fund, you can have more than one TPD claim, um, or you can have income protection that combined together can get you up to 75% or maybe more of your salary. Um, and you can also have in these insurance benefits outside of super, right? Uh, and they can be, you know, if you've got private, insurance that you arrange through a broker or your accountant or an agent or if it's provided through your employer you might have income protection through your employer you might have a lump sum for life you might have life cover and disability cover through that or through an association you belong to um, so you can have these sorts of benefits elsewhere um, and as I say that's my day job like getting people these things but the question here we're looking at is well if you get these things what impact can this have on Centrelink so they are subject to, they are treated by Centrelink in different ways. So if you get income protection payments, whether it's through super or outside, they will count towards the Centrelink income test, not surprisingly, because you're getting paid three grand a month or whatever from super, that will be taken into account. Um, now, <clears throat> often the income protection policies themselves have offsets for Centrelink. So 
it can be a real juggling exercise as to if you've got if you're eligible for job seeker or dsp and you've got this insurance benefit uh, is it worthwhile applying for the insurance benefit or is it worthwhile applying for centrelink or maybe you should delay it until you know the income protection is used up or whatever um, so there are issues around that it basically it's a numbers game you've got to do run all the figures to work out whether a combination of the both can mean it's still worthwhile because as the slides before said um, the off the offsetting is basic you know for the first amount if you're on the DSP the first 178 bucks a fortnight remember we said that is is exempt and then anything after that it's 50 cents in the dollar and for job seeker it's well, well, under the changes, the simplified changes that are happening next week, it's um, three hundred dollars a fortnight is the threshold, and then after that, sixty cents in the dollar comes off. So you've got it. Depend, so depending on what your income is before your disability, depending on what your settling entitlement is, and depending on what the monthly payment is under the income protection, if you after you run the figures, you can still be better off. You can still be in the in the positive territory if you apply for and accept it for the income protection. Then it's a goer. Right, but you've got to run the figures or get someone like me to run the figures for you. All right, so they can still be valuable, and they're a feature of, and they can be very valuable because <clears throat> sometimes they can be worth, you know, some people are covered for 75% of their income, and if you're on a decent wage, then that can be five, six, seven, ten grand a month, whatever, twenty grand a month. I've seen some like that. All right, so it's a case of running the figures, but you may be eligible for both, but it can impact on your settling. And if you're on the DSP and it stops it, there's healthcare, you know, the healthcare card issue is you don't want to, you don't want to lose your Centrelink entitlement because if you do, then it can, mean, it can mean you lose your healthcare card unless you've got a mobility allowance or something like that. All right, next one. Next one is the assets test. So this is treated in different ways. So this applies to the lump sum. So if you get a superannuation lump sum, which might be the account balance, or it might be the insurance benefit or both, then any monies paid out of super don't count towards the Centrelink assets test. Um, uh, they only count to, they, they don't count towards the income test they, and they don't count toward the assets test either, right? Um, uh, as they are taken out. But once they have become your asset, um, but one, once they become your asset, then um, the in, in monies you earn from it, is taken into account okay um so insurance tpd lump sums outside super do count towards the assets test right so um so if you've got a private policy that was sold to you by a broker or an agent or whatever and that and you get paid a half a million bucks then that will count towards your assets test and um uh, as it's taken as it's received by you and that can mean a, and that can affect your job seeker or your DSP. So it's important to, to check that and run the figures uh, about whether that's um, uh, what to be done. So with superannuation lump sums, for instance, what you can do, um, <clears throat> what, you, what you can do is um, if, if you, you've got options, if, you, if, a TP, if a TPD lump sum is accepted, then you've got options of taking the money out, rolling it over, quarantining some of it from, uh, uh, or investing some of it in one way or another. So there, there are all sorts of options you've got there. So it's, so you've got a bit more flexibility, but if it's outside of super, you just get paid the lump of dough. When you get paid the lump of dough, it counts towards your asset pool, bang. Um, and it could suspend your entitlement. And if it suspends your Centrelink entitlement, say it suspends your DSP in particular, if you're on the DSP under this old quarant legacy rate, you know, legacy test, then it stops it, and then you it, then you start. Then you apply again in the future. Then you can be subject to the harsher test. All right. So a few permutations and combinations there. Help. <laughs> so look, um, I'm sorry. I've done what I always do, which is um, overload you with info. Um, but uh, I, I suppose if I was trying to take, if I was trying to get you to take a message out of this, it's two things. One is you uh, Centrelink benefits are at a uh, are in play. If you've got a chronic illness and you can't work, you are you'll you'll be eligible for Centrelink. You can be eligible for Centrelink benefits, subject to the income and assets test. The Centrelink benefits you might get are job job seeker, um, <clears throat> which at the moment 
uh, and because of the coronavirus supplement has been quite generous, right? But it, it's being less, it's gonna become less generous as of next week. And then maybe from January, it'll be even less generous again. Uh, you also might be, alternatively, you might be eligible for the disability support pension. But the DSP is hard to hard to get, but it's hard to get, but it's not impossible. And the toolkit we've developed with or developed with SSRV is designed to help people with that. Um, so, and the and the DSP is now back in play, whereas for this six month period where we, there was this coronavirus supplement on the on the job seeker payment is starting to come back. In that six month period, it wasn't, you know. Who cares whether you're not eligible for a DSP because you're getting more on um, Job Seeker, but not so from next week. So it's back in play. The DSP is back in play. The importance of it's back in play. So you need to look at whether you're eligible for it, um, and um, that's what the toolkit's designed to do. But look, this stuff is dense. Uh, and then the other thing is, as I say, there's lots of insurance. There's lots of insurance and super implications for Centrelink benefits. You've got to look at. This is all dense stuff, I know. So if, the, if messages are, you can be eligible for job safe, good job keeper, it's DSP. It's back, DSP is back in play come next week. The rules are changing. Get advice on that, and in particular, get advice around what whether you're eligible for insurance and super, and what that can mean for your Centrelink payments. I've talked enough. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, John. No, that's great. It, you, you've, um, and the handouts are going to be really helpful for people as well to be able to review some of that information. There are some great questions coming in. I'm just going to give you a buffer by going through, and, and actually back on that slide, it's great to have that DSP toolkit link. So everyone's got that in their handouts. That's yeah. fantastic. It, and, it is important. Uh, the DSP it, toolkit link is important, um, but you, there will be questions arising from it. So call me anytime. I'll just deal with it. Yeah, go on. absolutely. Sorry. That's great. So these slides, everyone will have seen those slides before. So I'm literally just clicking through them so that I can get to a reminder to do the survey when we finish. But let me have a look at these questions. And I apologise in advance if I don't get to them all because some of them are. Um, and I also, if you need to go, feel free to go. We're recording the program. And not you, John. You're not allowed to go. Um, <laughs> But other people can go if they need to, and we're but recording. If you've got any program. questions? I'll, if there are any questions up that can't be dealt with now, I will reply to them. No problem. Yeah, that's wonderful, and that's what I was going to say. We always follow them up if I've missed something. So yeah. there's a there's some thank yous coming through, but there's a question, John. What's the website where people can find out where they their old supers? What is that website called? Oh, it's the Lost Super Register, right? So the ATO. Uh, the ATO has got the Lost Super Register, which spells out all your old super funds, right? Well, it doesn't spell out all of them. It's not it's not completely foolproof, but it's got a list of m most people's old superannuation funds. Now, that's good. That's good. But the key bit is, um, if you've got a disability and if you've already stopped work, you may be eligible for insurance benefits, depending on when you are a member of the fund when you had insurance, when you left that fund, because that the the ATO website tells you what old super you had and when it left, when you left the system, right? So it can be rolled over because there's a lot of consolidation of super going on. The key thing for the insurance stuff is what insurance did you have in your super when you last worked, or what insurance did you have in super at the period of time when you were unfit for work, which might mean you get income protection. There's all this stuff to look at. That's great. And it's the reminder that's why we often say to people, don't roll your insurance, your super's all in one. You might have two claims to make. Um, Correct. There's a question. Check at least before, yeah. If, if you get TPD from your super and mm. withdraw some of the money to pay debt, is that still part of the income test? No, it's not part of the income test. Cool. And once you qualify for DSP, it doesn't get reassessed. Again, I think the answer is no, except how you explained if you leave it and come back. Um, the, in practice, the answer is largely yes. In theory, the answer is no, right? You can't, even those people who got on the DSP before the big change happened in 2011, it's they're, it's called legacy, right? They're, they're, it's a, they're legacy TPD, uh, sorry, DSPers, right? 
largely they've been left alone by Centrelink, but they, Centrelink can review you. And I've seen some recently where they are reviewing, it's quite random the way they've done it. So you are not, you're not absolutely certain that they will leave you alone. They might, they can come back at you and say, right, we're going to assess you under the new rules. But the general rule of thumb is keep your head down. So one thing people get caught out on there is if someone wants to go overseas, not that you can do it now, but if you want to go overseas and you go overseas for more than a month, um, then your Centrelink will stop. Um, and unless you get special permission and some people say, oh, look, I, I need to go overseas for six months or whatever. Um, I need to, and you say, well, you can apply to Centrelink and get special permission. But if you do, you will be assessed. And if you are assessed, you could, you put your file on someone's table and they could assess you under the new rules. Um, if, if regarding DSP, if you're in a relationship and your partner earns 2,800 a fortnight, are you eligible for DSP or is your partner expected to support you financially? Um, if you're in a couple, if you're coupled, as they say, um, then uh, your the income of both is taken into account under the income and assets test. It's only if you're single that it operates differently. And the couple rates are collectively higher than the single rate, but not double, right? It's less than double. If you have superannuation and disability insurance on that superannuation, are yep. you still eligible for DSP or do you have to access the super first? You, yes, you are eligible for DSP. That's that offsetting thing, right? But the, the money you get from the disability income will count towards the income test that was on the, the, the formula was on the screens. The formula is the first hundred and if you're a single, first 178 bucks a fortnight, no effect. Anything after that, 50 cents in, 50 cents in the dollar, right? That's why I said, <clears throat> you've got to run the figures to see whether it's still worthwhile. Generally speaking, it is, right? So look, the most common one we see is HESTA. If you if you work in super, if you've got a super fund, if you work in the health industry, you're in HESTA and you're in HESTA, then HESTA has a monthly income benefits payable all the way up to age 67. Um, and, and, and if you stop work and you're on Centrelink, then uh, you've got to run the figures to see whether it's still worth your while to make the HESTA claim. And the answer is it still usually is, but it usually cuts it in half. So the benefit's not like, with HESTA, it's the base rate's like a thousand bucks a month. So it's not very high and it cuts it down to about 500 a month, but it can still be worthwhile. And the other question is, the person was in fact asked was, do you have to use up your, in, your income protection? The answer is, <coughs> the answer is yes, you do. Because Centrelink, if they if they wise up to the fact that you've got this income protection that you do, should have claimed, they say, well, we will deem you to be eligible for that and we will reduce your benefit accordingly, right? So even that, yeah. that, that usually applies if, if you apply for it and you're accepted for the claim and there's a thing called an offset clause. I don't want to get too complicated on people, but... Um, a lot of income protection claims in the slide have got offset clauses in them. So they say, if you're getting Centrelink, well, then we we will reduce what we pay you by what you're being paid from Centrelink. Centrelink says, no, nah, you're not doing that. We are deeming you to be getting the full rate and we're going to reduce your Centrelink accordingly. Yep. It's a level of complication, I know. Sorry. That's <laughs> fine. That's why you're here. <laughs> Um, Emma has a question, and you you alluded to some of this earlier. When when you're um, claim when you're applying for a DSP, and there was that line about medically stable and fully treated. So yep. if under, fully treated and stabilized, yep. Under neurologist advice, hmm. Emma's not on medication. Mm -hmm. Is that going to potentially be an issue when she, if she needs to, apply for a DSP? <clears throat> the answer is it could be, but her response to Centrelink saying that is, um, <clears throat> my condition, if I'm a blind, if I'm complying with medical advice, uh, mm -hmm. and the medical advice is that that is in my best interest, and that even, and if the doctors also said that even if she was on medication, it would not significantly improve her capacity to go back to work, 
then that's okay, right? That's that's part of the test for fully treated and stabilized. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. I, tell you, I tell you the most common example of fully treated and stabilized is people with mental health problems. Some people don't like, they've got, they've got psychosis. They don't like taking antipsychotic medication, right? They much prefer to go to psychological therapy sessions rather than taking antipsychotics, right? So it, Centrelink often say your condition is not fully treated and stabilized because you could try antipsychotics. And, and then the response to that is, yeah, but if I took the antipsychotics, if the evidence is that that would not improve significantly improve my ability to go back to work, then it doesn't matter. Okay, so it yep. plays out that way. That's great. Um, a question about the kind of timing. So yep. I'll, I'll read this because it's a little, it's it's got a couple of levels. So yep. um, so a TPD claim. You've got your medical certificate stating that you're no longer able to work in the profession that you were qualified for. Where's the point where you resign? Would you have already stopped work or do you risk the TPD being declined if you're still at work? What, what, what's the go with that? All right, the elig standard eligibility for TPD is you've got an injury illness that prevents you from working for at least six months and then you're assessed as being permanently unfit to do your normal job or any other suitable work within your area of expertise and experience, maybe with a retraining clause as well, right? So that's the requirement. Under almost all funds, under almost all definitions, it is not a requirement that you terminate your employment to make the claim. So you don't have to terminate your employment to make the claim, but you, you, will, use, you will often have to terminate your employment in order to be paid the benefit. So what I tell people is if we're doing help them with TPD claims to say, don't terminate your employment. Um, if your employer wants to wants to give you the heave ho, well, that's a different ball game. That's up to them. But don't give them a free kick by terminating your employment because you sort of burn the bridge then, don't you? So say say you terminate your employment and then your MS on the roller coaster, you feel better and you say, oh, look, you know what? I'm gonna put this TPD claim on hold and I'm gonna try and go back to work. If you've already terminated your employment, you've burnt your bridge, right? So that's why I say to people, don't terminate your employment. If your employer wants to move on your employment on the basis that you can't perform the inherent requirements of the job, so be it. But don't do it voluntarily. And you don't have to for the purpose of the TPD claim. Uh, a question about JobKeeper. Yeah. If you're a sole trader on JobKeeper yeah. and choose to do less work moving forward, even when the lockdown you know, limitations lift, so that you're reducing your risk, are you still eligible for those payments? You can be, yes. It depends on what, well, the, the, the eligibility requirements are turnover based, okay? Sole traders, so long as they satisfy the turnover based requirements, then they can be eligible for it. But of course, the, the amount of it's coming off, right? It's got, that's 1500 bucks a fortnight at the moment. It reduces to 1200 bucks a fortnight from next week. And then, uh, depending on what you're, in, depending on hours hours worked at the relevant dates, and then it comes down further to a thousand come um, January until March. So it's starting to come off, but it's been, yeah. As I say, I, I think it's been a really good program. That's great. Um, is there an equivalent to the SSRV in other states, John? Yes, there is. There's uh, SSRV is uh, in New South Wales. It's called uh, welfare rights unit. Uh, Queensland is called basic rights. WA it's called it's SSRV, I think. No, it's not. So it's uh, welfare rights in Western Australia. Um, yeah, so they're everywhere. They're in each state, um, and they're great. They're just they're brilliant, or they're so good. They're amazing, um, um, <clears throat> and they've got. But the toolkit is something was developed um, here in Victoria. And they've got they've de and they've developed the um, the online uh, the online tool um, in Victoria, but it's it, it Centrelink is a national it's a national benefit, so the rules are the same essentially, mm -hmm. right? So you can use it in any other state, um, but uh, SSRV won't be able to give you advice if you're from another state, but I can I can do what I like, <laughs> so just tell them to contact me and I'll sort them out. Because part of the thing with the DSP is 
which of these tables do you come under right that's part of the part of the the quiz you've got to do that sort of as a threshold thing to work out which tables you come under to get the right proformers to the right doctors yeah right? and if you've got a dual disability that is all still within the correct. same tables yeah correct correct yeah. yep and can a program of support occur before a DSP application is submitted? Yes. And um, okay. And does the MS Employment Support Service qualify as a program of support? Yeah, yeah you guys are in that. I'm, I'm sure you are. Yeah. You know better that your folk know better than that than I. But I'm sure you guys are. I'm, I'm positive you are. And as I say, some most of them are good. They're really good, right? Um, but and then through no fault of the MS Society, the blunt instrument in it is people, while you're going through this, and it's an eight, and the standard is, it says under the, the DSP uh, guide, it's 18 months. And for that period of time, you are not on the DSP, right? And, and therefore, if it's 350 or 400 bucks a fortnight difference, that's a big hit. So if you get through the gateway of the, the table the impairment tables through the serious, it helps a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, medically retired on a defined super benefit. Yes. If uh, if the person feels better in the future, to what extent can they start working and still keep the pension? Is that that yeah. threshold of earning? Um, no, it, it's it's what what the person's talking about there is if you've been medically retired. <clears throat> so they work for government and they're medically retired. It's medical retirement for the purposes of superannuation of on on usually, right? So what it means is say say you're in it's, it depends on what super fund you're in, right? So if you are in say you're in Victoria uh, and you're in the you work in the state government and you've been there for a long time, you're in a super fund called ESSS, right? And if you're medically retired, you're eligible for an invalidity pension. For the rest of your life, right? And it's it's a it's an extraordinarily generous pension. It's in the marketplace. The defined benefits scheme, invalidity retirement benefits, are from the government schemes, and that's PSS and CSS in the federal government. And in Victoria, it's ESSS. In New South Wales, it's SAS or or superannuation uh, or superannuation scheme in um, Queensland it's Q super in South Australia it's uh, what is it it's super SA etc so right these old defined benefit schemes they pay they usually pay for invalidity retirement they usually pay lifetime pensions right so if you're on that lifetime pension you usually get it now if at some stage in the future you feel better and you want to try to go back to work it depend it does vary from one scheme to the other the rules of the fund from the other but under most of them you can earn you it either has no effect if you go back to work or if you do or if you do go back to work it you can earn a certain amount threshold amount before it affecting your pension so it so um, sort of separate to Centrelink stuff right that's about the the effect on your invalidity pension through super of a return to work is that worth a yeah, phone call i know call? the answer to all those so you just need to contact me and i'll sort yeah. it out so, so give John a call. Um, <laughs> what are the options around job keeper? No, no, job seeker or DSP if your condition isn't stabilised. Right. Well, if your condition's not stabilised, then you're not eligible for the DSP. All right. Oh. You're eligible for job seeker. Now, as yeah. I say, for these last six months, who cares? Um, you know, you know better. You're in fact better off, which is bizarre. Um, <clears throat> but you know, uh, it's winding down and now it's flipped so that the DSP is back to pay more than job key, job seeker and come January next year, it might be back to the 300, you know, three or 400 bucks a fortnight difference. So stabilize that, but, but as I say, stabilization, you know, if you condition, so or MS, you know, the fatigue issues doesn't necessarily I mean, mean it's stable. not stable. <laughs> Well, that's right. So if you've ha if it's not getting better, if it's plateauing in the sense that it's not getting better, so so that it doesn't improve your significantly improve your capacity to return to work, that's enough, right? That's stable enough. 
That's what the rules say. John, that's been fabulous. Thank you so much for your time. I think we've reached the end of today's questions, but as John has said, he's always willing to take a phone call and John's number is in the slide kit, the handouts that we sent earlier today. And if you don't have it, by all means get in touch and we'll give you John's number. But thank you everyone for being online and your fabulous questions, because that's always really great to have um, the, you know, answering what you're needing. And thank you so much again, John, for your time in preparing and for being with us this morning. Yeah, no so worries. Look, I'm, as I say, I'm sorry, it's, it's, there's a lot of stuff there and it's really dense, um, but yeah, anytime, any place, just give me a call. That's great. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Again. Thanks everybody. We'll look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Thanks for joining yeah. us today. No worries. Bye-bye.